let them leave with you touching them. Touch them, use humor, and everything changes. If you touch them, they have something they can take away. When we, we connect with these shows like Walking Dead or whatever the good shows are because each and every time some sort of emotion touches us and we want to experience that again. That's a takeaway. So show that emotion. Antagonism. This is where the material comes from. What inspires you? Now some people again think of antagonism as anger. Antagonism isn't anger. It's confusion. It's like, what's, it's like Jerry Seinfeld. What's up with bugs? <laughs> that, becomes, that comes because you're confused about something. You want answers to it. I don't get this. What's going on with that? Or if you see something like George Carlin said, he said, take your, take, do you ever watch TV or read the news and call BS? I go all the time. He goes, make that your comedy. Take that. Take something that drives you. Now your emotions will be attached to it. But you don't always need emotion to write funny. You can write mechanically and have something to be funny. And so sometimes when I was writing for Leno, I wasn't emotionally attached to the content, to the material or the topic, but I had to find mechanically how to make that funny. So structurally, I would just build that into the, into the sets. We'll get into that in a second. Surprise. Also, every joke should can contain some element of surprise. Exaggeration and realism, these two work together, and it's essential to understand the difference between the two. Comedy is heightened reality. It's not complete absurdity. If it's complete absurdity, it's no, no longer plausible. If it's not plausible, we don't believe it. If we don't believe it, we fold our arms. So if you go way out of the way and you try to put two ideas that could never fit together, then it won't work. The only way to make that work is to put it into imagination and say, what if this was this and this connected with that? Could you imagine how that would be? Now we'll go with you on this journey. But if you try to say two things that just couldn't happen, then we just <coughs> tune it out. That's then you'll see the laughter just stop immediately. Sometimes you'll go back and review, the review a joke and go, how come that didn't pay off? And you'll go, oh, there's no way that could ever work. The audience is not buying it. So exaggeration and realism have to go together. Comedy is heightened reality. It's not complete absurdity. We've moved on from the Three Stooges. A ball peen hammer to the head is not funny. <laughs> yeah, if it ever was. I don't know. When I was watching that stuff when I was in third grade, I was like, ah. It's not funny to me. <laughs> it was a cartoon that was a little funny. The real people, they didn't like that. You know? When real people get hurt, it's, no, it's not funny to me. Unless they get up. Yeah. Then it's funny. You know? Or unless it's somebody that really needs to go down. <laughs> then it's funny. Here are, the, here are the 13 comedy structures. 13 comedy structures, double entendres, triples or three-way build-ups, they're called. Uh, the reverse, incongruity, uh, simple truth, superiority, paraphrases, slapstick, recognition, compare and contrast, benign retaliation, comedic irony, and paradox. Will this be on the exam? Yes, it will be, we'll be on the exam. If, uh, you don't have to know them all right now, but when you do know them all, it gives you an opportunity to write funny on anything. And the beauty of that is, is like most comedians, even professionals working today, and most writers, still only use three or four. And there, and there, if you watch Jimmy Fallon and he really study the shows now, he's really using three or four concepts. And that's it. He's, some of the concepts he just doesn't use. And they're very effective. I got my job with uh, Jay Lynn on The Tonight Show because I used the three-way buildup. Three-way buildup creates surprise because it involves pattern disruption. A lot of pattern disruption is automatically surprise. Like if, and it starts when we're infants. You ever go to a baby and go, oh, boo. Yeah. They either laugh or cry. <laughs> Mostly they laugh because you have a pattern that's going, oh, instead of go, oh, and it changes the pattern. You disrupt the pattern. You increase the chance of getting laughter because you have surprise. Surprise is a result of pattern disruption. So if you do a three way buildup, you'll see how this works. And what I love about the three way buildup, it usually comes out of a news story or something someone said in journalism. And we love to talk in threes. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And, we, and we, when journalists report news, they usually re report in threes. They'll give you three things that are happening in, a, in an event, rather than just one. Like, and when I, was, when I first committed myself to really writing and really studying the structures, it didn't take me long to really start to master them, and it really didn't take me long to get my job writing for Jay Leno. It just sort of happened when I made that commitment, decided this is where I'm going. Thing was, is here I was, I was an actor, and then I saw my dad go through the ups and downs of his career, working, then not working, working, then not working, the writer strike, director strike, actor strike, back to back to back, having to sell a house, and I said, wow, I really want to do this, but I don't want to go through these ups and downs, how can I hedge my bet? And I learned, stand, and I got into stand-up comedy, I said, now I can work when I'm not working. 
Mm. So then I really started to study the structure of comedy because when I first started in comedy, I was doing these stories that would hit and miss, they weren't consistent. I'd get some laughs and it just wasn't getting a lot of work. It's just starting out. And then I saw two things. I remember being in a hotel room and my wife called me, we couldn't pay the electric bill. And I went, oh, I've got to do something. We had a baby on the way. She said she was pregnant. I said, well, there, were two, there was good news there and bad news. The good news was I had something to do with pregnancy. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the bad news was that I could, we could barely pay the electric bill. And she's like, you need to get a real job. Uh, and I was like, oh. uh, so I said, I've really got to learn this. And at one point, I decided to go back to college. And I'd get, I'll get a degree. I had two more years left. And I said, I'll get a degree in English. And that way I can teach. And I'm up in college, and I'm going to the library. I'm somebody going to get going to get straight A's, and I go to the uh, library every day and go to the study table. But on the way to the study table, I stop at the magazine rack, I pick up a magazine, some newspapers, and I start writing jokes. And my heart rate would increase. I'd get so into it, I'm so excited about it. And I sat there and finally said to myself, "Why am I here, studying for a degree I don't want a job in, when I could be down in LA really studying for a job I really want?" And I, 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 you know, and I remember being at that hotel after my wife called and saw two things on TV that changed my life. One was Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> he was actually in a, doing an old club uh, thing, and, it was, they, and he said, said this joke right here. He said, comedy's in my blood. Too bad it's not in my material. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed, but the thing that really connected me with that joke was comedy's in my blood. And I was like, comedy is in my blood. That's who I am. It's not just what I do, it's who I am. So I said, I gotta do this. Then, changing the channels after the comedy was over, I saw Tony Robbins. And I'm in New York, you know? I usually think these guys are charlatans, you know? I'm a skeptic. So he said one thing that really resonated. He says, you wanna succeed at something. You wanna succeed in your market niche. Find somebody who's successful and copy them. And he doesn't mean to steal material. What he's saying, find out what they do. Why are they successful? How come they're getting laughs? And copy them. So that's when I went home. I decided to get every tape I could find of comedy. I watched all the comedy shows. I, I studied day and night, like five, six hours a day, the same amount of time I was putting in college, and I started to write jokes. I started to watch The Tonight Show. So I set my goals. I said, I want to write for The Tonight Show. So I started watching The Tonight Show, writing out all their jokes, longhand figuring out how that rhythm feels, what it sounds like, telling the jokes to myself over and over, then writing the, the straight line of the joke and trying to come up with my punchline of the joke. And then eventually, uh, I started to get it. Then I was uh, doing my joke writing every morning from 7 to 11 a.m. I was in front of the TV watching CNN, and the, and the uh, journalist gets on. She goes, uh, she goes, Oahu, Hawaii lost power to the whole island this morning. Court buildings were shut, shut down, traffic lights were out, and about 150,000 kids got to stay home from school today. And knowing the three-way buildup, I went, oh, there's two after she said the first two. Traffic lights were out, court buildings were shut down. And I wrote it down. Court buildings shut down, all they had to do was cross out the third one and come up with something that was heightened, had heightened reality, but still related to what would happen if electricity went out. Mm -hmm. I said, what's funny with uh, dealing with electricity? First thing I thought of, stick your finger in the socket, hair goes like this. Right? Oh and I thought, who has hair like that? Don King. Right? So I go, what would Don King be doing in Hawaii? On vacation. So I said, uh, did you guys hear about this? Oahu, Hawaii lost power to the entire island. Traffic lights were out, court buildings were shut down, and a vacationing Don King was seen with flat air. <laughs> <laughs> so right away, now people say writing current events jokes is hard. I go, why? They write the first half for you. <laughs> All you have to do is come up with the punchline. Just make, make it associated to what the subject matter is, heightened in reality and still visual and plausible, and you have a laugh. So under, beginning to understand the mechanics of it changed the way I wrote. And then I was writing every day, and I set a process. So then there's uh, the three-way buildup that's very masterful. The one we're going to really focus on, we're going to focus on uh, two here today, a double entendre and the reverse. So here's three things you can do right now. You can take the double entendre theory. The theory is uh, we have multiple words in our English language that have two or more meanings. It's French, double entendre, and it means uh, two or more meanings. So it, we have lots of words that have two or more meanings. And if you, there's the implied meaning, and then there's the humorous meaning. So if you have the implied meaning as a humorist, 
you're always having on those humor glasses. You always have on those skeptics glasses, or cynical, or sometimes surprise-oriented, a different meaning, looking for a different meaning. So when somebody says one word, how many people have that friend that takes everything that you say and turns it into some sexual connotation? <laughs> right, it's surprising, it's shocking, but they're always doing it, always doing it. They're using the double entendre, but you don't have to go sexual. A lot of people think, once they think of comedy, they go, oh, it's sex, or it's blue, or it's naughty. It doesn't have to be dirty, you know? I used to say F-bombs are not punchlines. You don't have to. You just need good, solid, structured surprise to trigger laughter, be, be, be able to understand what triggers laughter. So take this line right here. Did you find everything you were looking for? Let's look at that line. When you leave a grocery store, what do they ask you? Did you, did you find everything you were looking for? I don't know when that happened, but about two, three years ago, all of a sudden, everybody started to ask us that, right? And no matter what store we were in, I'm thinking they went to a retail convention. The keynote speaker got up there and said, if you ask these words, did you find everything you were looking for? Odds are, somebody's going, I couldn't find the mayonnaise. And the average price is $3.29 for mayonnaise. And imagine how many people ask this, answer this question. We could make X billion dollars more a year. It's like, yeah! No matter where you are, that's what they ask. Every one of them. Some retailer convention that happened, right? So if you take that phrase, did you find everything you were looking for?